Good morning. Welcome to our service today. We're so glad to have you with us here at Bethlehem Christian Church. Those of you who are with us today, as well as watching online, we're so honored with your presence. And we trust that God will be here with us this morning as he is that Emmanuel, God with us. Let's open up with a word of prayer and then we will begin with our Advent reading. Father, we ask God that you would speak to us today, God. Lord, as we go into this week of joy God, there's no greater joy than knowing you. And the only way that was made possible was through the incarnate Christ who came and was born of a virgin and lived a sinless life, took his sin, took our sins upon himself, died on the cross, was buried in a bar tomb, and three days later rose again from the dead and is right now at your right hand interceding for us. So, Father, may we take joy and comfort in that today. God, may you be blessed and honored and glorified by everything that is said, done, and sung this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite Brendan, Elizabeth, and Annabelle up for our Advent reading. Good morning, everyone. Looks like my daughter's going to be shy. <laughs> uh, on this Sunday of Advent, as we think about the coming of Jesus Christ, we light the candle of joy. When Christ comes into our lives, he brings the fullness of joy. Isaiah 61, 3 states, he anoints our hearts with the oil of gladness. At the time of Jesus' birth, the angels announced to the shepherds that his coming was good news of great joy for all people. Because Christ has come to us, we can live every day in the joy of the Lord. Praise to his name. Um. Before uh, Brendan sits down, you can come back up here with me. Yeah, you can come too. It'd be great. No, let me put this back on. Don't want the governor to come chase me down anywhere. Two weeks ago, uh, after the service, uh, Brendan approached me and said that he wanted to, to talk to me. And um, we come to find out that he had never actually accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. And uh, he gave me the awesome privilege of being able to walk him through the plan of salvation. And uh, after that service, he prayed and accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. Amen. And uh, we talked about him coming forward and making a, a public profession of faith. And uh, Brennan, when we spoke on that Sunday, did you accept Christ as your Savior? Yes. And you're going to try to follow him the, the rest of your days as best you can? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, church is incumbent on us as fellow Christians and believers to make sure that we just don't end it there. It's our responsibility to disciple him and disciple uh, the, the rest of the crew and especially the shy one. And uh, make sure that they grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we need to make sure that they're growing in the knowledge of Christ. So make sure that you welcome him into the family of God and that you give them all the help and, and love and uh, hope that you can give them. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, that means we've got to get a baptism pretty soon, too. Maybe we can work that out before the end of the year. So uh, anyway, God bless you, Brendan. Let's pray for Brendan uh, and ask God to help him during these times. Father, I, I thank you so much that Brendan was willing to come forward and admit his sin and his need for you and that he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Master. And God, we know that, that even when we accept Christ, we still don't become perfect people. We're still lost sinners who are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. So we pray, God, that the power of the Holy Spirit that's within him will guide him into all truth, that will conform him into the image of Christ, 
God, that you would be with Elizabeth, God, and be with them as they grow uh, in their, their relationship. God, that they would seek you first. And God, as we all seek you first, we all automatically draw closer together. So, Father, I pray that you'll bless and be with our church. God, show us how we can disciple them and help them grow. And, God, that we can love them and show them the way that, that believers should, should walk and talk and act. God, we thank you. And for these reasons, we have great joy in what you've done in his life and what you're going to do in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, bud. All right, if you will, turn in your Bibles this morning, please, to Psalm chapter 6 for our call to worship. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the psalmist writes, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul is also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death, there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night, I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. Isn't it great to know that when you feel like everything's falling apart, when your life is in total shambles, when, when you just can't seem to be able to put the pieces together, people are persecuting you and coming after you in your life and in your work and in your family, that the Lord hears your prayers and the Lord accepts your prayers. Even when you don't feel like it, he hears them and he accepts them because he is God with us, Emmanuel and if that doesn't bring you joy, I don't know what else can. So with that in mind, let's stand together and we're going to sing three verses of joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let's stand together as we sing. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive. sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing joy to the earth the savior reigns let all their songs employ while fields and floods rocks hills and plains repeat the sound sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders seated. Good morning. A scripture reading from Isaiah chapter 7, starting with verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. 
But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the lamp the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy house, father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. Thank you, Fred. For our pastoral prayer today, I normally don't single out individuals. Uh, to pray for uh, in, in public settings. I, I don't necessarily think that's always appropriate. But I'm sure that you've noticed a, a void up here at the front. We're so glad to have our piano player with us this morning. But uh, I want to be in prayer today for uh, Wayne Gardner and uh, ask that God will just touch him in a special way. He's been such a blessing for us and for you guys forever. But he's been a personal blessing to me uh, over the last few months in helping us. And uh, we just want to pray for some healing and uh, pray for some comfort and encouragement for him today. So if you will, please join me in prayer for uh, Brother Wayne. Father, we praise you, God, that you are the great physician. God, that you are in control of our bodies. You are in control of the medical providers. You're in control of doctors. God, you're in control of our days. And God, we ask in it that you would just in a special way be with uh, Brother Wayne God, he's been such a blessing and such a soldier for you here at this church. God, he's led people in worship through his beautiful piano playing and organ playing. God, I pray that you would just touch him and his family in such a special way, God, that you would just bring healing to him. And God, that you would just bring him back to us. God, I thank you so much, Lord, that, that there are so many here, God, who have spent years and years sacrificing and serving, not for themselves, for your kingdom and God we pray that you will honor them for that God we know that you've promised that when our day does come God that you will give us a crown of life that we can give back to Jesus for all that he's given to us so God we pray that you'll be with him today God show us how we can love him how we can help him and God how that we can disciple him even in these days Lord we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'd like to invite the boys and girls to come up front. And anybody else that wants to? All right. Anybody know what this is? It's a helicopter. Can you tell me anything else about it? It has a special job. What? It flies people to the hospital. That's right. This is a picture of the Nightingale. I'm not sure if the one we have named Nightingale or not, but um, that's what its job is. Now. Yeah. It's actually called a medevac um, helicopter, and it takes people to the hospital if they get hurt real bad and they're a long ways from the hospital or, and there's, there's no doctor close by and it's too far for the ambulance to take them because they're so bad off. And um, so this helicopter can land most anywhere in a field, anywhere it needs to, and the paramedics uh, load that injured person up and fly them off to the hospital as fast as they can. Like in 15 minutes, you can be right there and there in Norfolk. Now, my friend Joyce, who used to teach across the hall from me, was in a car accident some years ago, and she was broken all to pieces. And the Nightingale helicopter came and picked her up and took her to Norfolk. She was laying on a stretcher. And when she heard that helicopter noise and she looked up in the sky, 
she knew help was coming. And the helicopter crew picked her up and flew her to the hospital and they put her back together and she's still with us and her family, and she taught school several more years. This medevac helicopter I have this picture of actually makes me think about Christmas. Now you're thinking, what in the world? It reminds me of all those people in the Christmas story who discovered that help was coming. One night the shepherds, here's our little shepherd boy, the shepherds were out in the field with their sheep and they looked up in the sky when they heard a strange new noise they hadn't heard before. And there were angels in the sky and the angels sang and said to the shepherds, a child is born to you this day, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And when the shepherds looked up in the night sky and they saw those angels, they knew help was coming. And then there were the three wise men, here they are. They looked up in that night sky and they saw that big star and they knew this star meant a special king was about to be born who was going to save his people. And when those three wise men looked up and saw that big star, they knew help was coming. And then there's Mary right here. As she was lying there resting after she had just given birth, and she looked up and saw that baby Jesus. She knew help was coming. God loves you so much and he wants to save you from your sin and sorrow. So he sent help from heaven. He sent baby Jesus who grew up to take all our sins to the cross with him. When Jesus came, help came. And hope came. And salvation came. At Christmas, when you look at the manger scene here, or you look up at that big empty cross behind me, you can remember not only is help coming, help came. All the help we'll ever need came to each one of us at Christmas as baby Jesus. Our King, our Lord, our Savior, help is here. Let's have a prayer together. Dear Lord, you know our needs before we even do. Thank you for giving us your help when we need it. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I have something for you. This is to put on your tree at home. It says, Bethlehem Christian, Merry Christmas, Jesus is born, 2020. This is a gift from your church. You might want to put your name on the back. There you go. Since they do all kind of look alike. That's one for you and one for your sister. There's one for you. and one for you. Thank you. All right. Now you take those home and hang them up every year and enjoy them, okay? Thank you very much. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Phares and Zerah of Tamar, and Phares begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram. And Aram begat Amanabad, and Manabad begat Nasson, and Nasson begat Salmon. And Salmon begat Boaz of Rashab, and Boaz begat Abed of Ruth, and Abed begat Jesse. And be Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. And Solomon begat Reboam, and Reboam begat Abiah, 
and Abia beget Asa. And Asa beget Josaphat, and Josaphat beget Joram, and Joram beget Ozias, and Ozias beget Jotham, and Jotham beget Akaz, and Akaz beget Ezekias. And Ezekias beget Manassas, and Manassas beget Ammon, and Ammon beget Josias. And Josias beget Jeconius and his brethren about the time that they were carried to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconius beget Salathiel, and Salathiel beget Zorobabel. And Zorobabel beget Abuad, and Abuad beget Elikim, and Elikim beget Azor. And Azor beget Sadak, and Sadak beget Akim, and Akim beget Eluid. And Eluid beget Eleazar, and Eleazar beget Mathen, and Mathen beget Jacob. And Jacob beget Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on the wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Please keep your Bibles open to Matthew 1, if you will. You have to be impressed with that reading, don't you? <clears throat> I had to get someone I knew I could trust with all those things, and there's nothing like competition in the legal field to get people working harder to you know, make sure everything's said the right way. He did a great job, and I appreciate you uh, doing that, Fred. There are two times when church attendance seems to magically rise. What are those two times? Christmas and Easter. Christmas and Easter. Now, when it comes to actually, actually getting involved in the service, I think Easter is probably actually more well-attended believe it or not, than Christmas services are. I think maybe part of it is because when you come on Easter, you've got the pretty dresses, it's warmer temperatures, you get to look nicer, you've got your, your Easter suit on, the kids have their new Easter clothes, and, and, and there's just something about Easter and the resurrection that comes that just gets people excited. Uh, so I would say probably Easter you actually get more attendance, at least that's been my uh, general observation. I think Christmas is a close second, though. But I think sometimes we really don't consider the importance of the Christmas story. I mean, we understand it. We understand that Christmas isn't about Santa Claus. We understand that Christmas isn't about Frosty the Snowman and Rudolph, although it is somewhat about those things. We enjoy those things every now and again. Sorry for the, the curmungeons who don't enjoy having the, that kind of fun. I have that kind of fun, and I don't see that there's any issue with that. But the key is, is that we know what we're really here for. Christmas is about the incarnation of the Messiah. You say, what in the world is incarnation? It's really not that hard. It's, it's, a, it's a nickel theological term that makes us preachers sound a lot smarter than what we really are. But it's really just incarnate. Carnate is flesh. So when we say incarnation, we are talking about when something was made flesh. And so when we talk about the incarnation of the Messiah, we are talking about how God, 
the second person of the Trinity, became flesh, became one of us. And that is a central tenet of our belief system. We cannot be born again without believing that Jesus was our Savior. And in order to be our Savior, he had to be one of us. And so when we talk about, hey, I would like to learn how to share the gospel more. I'd like to know how to share my testimony. I'd like to know how to share my faith. Well, interestingly, God gives us four Gospels, four testimonies of the good news of what Jesus did. And he gives us the story of how Jesus came to be one of us. Now, we're going to go through the Gospel of Matthew over the next uh, couple months. So we'll be looking at his narrative of the birth of Jesus. And, of course, there are others. So feel free to you know, check those other ones out and look through those. Matthew comes at, the, at his book with a particular purpose. The purpose of the Gospel of Matthew is to demonstrate that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Davidic king and the seed of Abraham. He's writing to a particular Jewish audience so that they can understand that the reality of their Jewish faith actually finds its zenith and its climax in the coming life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That he is the ultimate fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. So Matthew is coming at it with a Jewish lens. And we're going to see that as we look through the book. There are no Gospels that contain as many Old Testament references as the Gospel of Matthew. Luke is written with an eye toward Gentiles. And we'll see the distinctions in the genealogies that that Fred shared with us in Matthew. If you go to Luke 3, you'll see that there's a little bit of a difference between the two. And it's because of their purpose in writing. Matthew's addressing a Jewish audience. And so when we look at this text of Matthew chapter 1, we can see the incarnation of the Messiah. We can see the coming of Jesus God with us. And in this chapter, there are three proofs of the incarnation of the Messiah that we can hang on to. The first proof of the incarnation of the Messiah is his kingly heritage. His kingly heritage. Now, we're not going to reread all of those names again. Frankly, some of you already look tired enough, and I think if we did begat, 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 I'd probably have to get some electric shocks to get y'all moving in here this morning. So we're not going to do that. But there are some key things that we can look to in this this text to show the kingly heritage of Christ. In verse 1, it says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, we know that the entire book of Matthew is not a genealogy. So why does he start this gospel with this phrase? Well, just as the rest of the gospels do, Matthew begins with a prologue. Before he gets into what Jesus did, he gives some background information about his origin and who he is. And every single gospel does that. Mark does that, Luke does that, and John does that. They all have a prologue to kind of set the stage for who Jesus is and where he came from. And so here Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Now he takes these two names along with Christ and makes those the bullet points of Old Testament history. See, David was the king of Israel. He was the king that was anointed by God to be the king. Samuel anointed him and he became king after many, many, many years. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 through 16, God promised David that his throne would reign forever. That he would be, a king from David would always be on the throne of eternity. And that meant something to the Jewish people. They knew the Messiah had to come from the seed of David. Because he was the king. 
And that gave the people of Israel some strength and some promise. Because you understand that the Romans were in charge during this time. They didn't have that kingly reign. They were looking for a Messiah to come and and that Messiah to set things right and to defeat the people of Rome and to set up a Jewish kingdom once again under the throne of David. So when they see this, when they read this, they say, he is the promised son of King David. He is the Messiah. But he also throws something in there for us. He says, the son of of Abraham. And in Genesis 22, after Abraham had taken his son Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice to God, and God rescued Isaac from the altar, he gave Abraham a promise because of his faith in trusting that God could even raise his son Isaac from the dead. He said, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. All the nations didn't just mean Jewish nations. It meant all nations. As one old preacher used to say, all means all, and all is all that all means. So that includes all of us. He is our Messiah as well. But he chooses Abraham, whereas Luke starts with Joseph and works backwards to Adam. And he does that because he's writing to a Gentile audience. So he knows who he's writing for. He's writing to these Jewish folks. And Abraham was was like, and you'll see as we go through this book, that was the person that the Pharisees always pointed at. Oh, look at Abraham, look at Abraham. Because he was such a model for the Jews. So you see there through the text that it starts there with Abraham. He doesn't begin at the very beginning of time. He starts with Abraham and works through those children. Now, another interesting thing about this genealogy, it includes women. It includes women. And not just any women. They are all, get this, Gentile women. They are Gentile women. Now, understand how the Jewish history worked. They hated Gentiles. They hated them. And yet, God saw fit to include in the line of Christ through Joseph, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. You know, people think Bathsheba was a Jew because David took her later as his wife. But you'll see here in the text, and he makes a point of it. He was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was not a Jew. He was a Hittite. And Bathsheba was his wife. They would not have allowed a marriage of that magnitude, which is why David was the only one who would be able to do that. He was king. Gentile women were included in this. That was revolutionary to these people. That these Gentile women would have an influence and be in the kingly line of Christ. You know what else we can notice about this genealogy? Are the sinful people in this. Abraham, at one point in his life, didn't trust God. And so he took another wife to try to force a seed. And he had his son Ishmael. God had rejected him. And as a result, Ishmael... And his later son Isaac were at war. Look at, the, look at the rest of the text. Judah engaged in prostitution with his daughter-in-law. Judah was in the, th- in the promised line of Jesus. David, an adulterer and a murderer, is in the kingly line of Christ. You keep going down through some of the kings of old. You go through and look at their stories in the books of Kings and the books of Chronicles. And you see, even in that line, that there were wicked kings that were in the genealogy of Christ. And yet, they are all part of that kingly heritage to get us to Christ. Then, in verse 12, he takes us to the deportation to Babylon when Israel was taken captive. And led away with a small remnant remaining. 
of the poor and the oppressed. Now there's no Old Testament you know, to back up uh, the names in verses 12 through, 7, uh, 12 through 16. But history has demonstrated that these names were likely uh, correct and were likely established to be the right lineage here. So we see that there was wickedness that led up to the line of Christ. Now he says that there are 14 generations. If you actually count through, it's kind of like 7 on 7 on 7 times 2. He, he kind of uses the same name a couple of times. But the reason that 14 was important, uh, scholars believe, is because the letters for, for the Hebrew name of David, which would have been Dalet and Vav and Dalet, if you add those up, would be 6, I'm sorry, 4, 6, 4, which adds up to 14. And he was again throwing them another bone to say, this is about the line of David. This is about the kingly heritage of Christ. So we see that he is the promised seed, he is the promised king, and he was born from a sinful line. What does that mean for us today? Does that have any bearing for us? What does it mean that Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ, why does this genealogy even matter? Because as we will later see, Joseph wasn't the biological father of Jesus. He was the legal father of Jesus. Why does this genealogy matter? Because by adopting Christ, Christ got all of the ability and rule and reign that came from that kingly line. And it was adopted on Jesus through Joseph. It's important. A lot of people look at Luke 3 and think that that genealogy is the genealogy of Mary, but it's not. It's just a different gene genealogy and fuller genealogy than this one. They're, but they're both of Joseph. Just as Christ was able to get those adoptive rights through the kingly line, we today are able through the adoption, the legal adoption that we talked about in Ephesians 1. Do you remember that? When we talked about the benefits of being born again. When we become children of God, we are adopted into his kingdom. We are adopted into his family. Yes, we're born again into the kingdom. But we are also legally adopted to have all the rights and abilities that come from being a child of God. And it doesn't matter how sinful you've been. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're good or bad. You have a line of opportunity to be in the line of Christ. To be able to one day in his eternal kingdom rule and reign with him. You get to be a part of his genealogy. Isn't that great? Isn't that awesome? We get to be a part of the line of Christ by being adopted into the family of God. And it doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter how ugly our sin. It doesn't matter how many times we fail. We can still be a part of the family of God. That's just amazing. The second proof of the incarnation of the Messiah is his miraculous conception. His miraculous conception. After going through the kingly heritage, Matthew goes on then to write, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. He's given the origin story. He says, when Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child. See, during this time, they hadn't come together because they weren't married. But their engagement is a little different than how we get engaged today. Back then, it was a legally binding engagement that could only be broken by a divorce. Imagine having to divorce your fiancé. That, that would be interesting. Uh, you know, I guess it would build our business a little bit more. I don't know. But uh, you know, that, that, that just is, is foreign to us, but that's how they did things. And that's why Joseph was called her husband, even though they weren't married yet. Because legally, 
they were bound to each other until they came together and consummated the marriage. But she was found to be of child from the Holy Spirit. This causes a lot of problems in our modern scholarship. This causes a lot of problems for people who think they know a lot of things, who think they have a lot of intelligence, who think that the miraculous just doesn't happen. There's always an explanation for it. There is no earthly explanation for this. The child was born of the Holy Spirit. And this is important to note because during the time that Matthew's writing this book, they're facing a, a, an attempt to, to bring down Christianity through a, a teaching called docetism. Docetism taught that, God was, uh, that Jesus was not really human. He wasn't really a person. He was kind of a figment of our imagination. He was a spirit that looked like a person. And he had to explain here, no, no, no. He was a human being but he was a human being that was born and conceived of the Holy Spirit. He was the new Adam, created by God within the womb of Mary. You say, well, that's just preposterous. I can't believe that. Well, that's okay. We all have the right to be wrong. But the Bible is what it is. The word is truth. We don't have to explain ourselves to anybody. We don't have to defend it to anybody. And by the way, none of the gospel writers do that. They just tell it like they saw it. They tell it like they wrote it. They tell it like they heard it. You know, no one comes to Christ unless the Spirit draws them. It's not our responsibility to argue people into heaven. It's our job to share our testimony, to share the truth that Christ has given us through his word, and let the Spirit do his work. See, a lot of us, we get really intimidated, don't we, sharing our faith. We, we, we get nervous being worried about, well, I don't want to be rejected. What if we get in an argument and I don't know everything about the Bible? Yeah, that's okay. You can just share your testimony. How did Christ change you? How did you come to know Christ? People can never argue with your story. They can argue facts. They can argue you know, teachings. They can argue all that. They can't argue with a changed life. They can refuse it, they can reject it, but they can't argue with it. So share it. Share the miraculous work that Christ has done in you. Now Joseph, it says, was her husband being a just man and not wanting to embarrass her. He was going to divorce her quietly, which meant that he would have needed two witnesses to privately do that according to Deuteronomy 24. But while he was thinking about doing that, he fell into a dream, and in that dream, an angel approached him and said, don't be afraid. Isn't that a great word for us today? Don't be afraid. Living in a culture of fear, isn't it great to hear those words? Don't be afraid. Why? Why shouldn't he be afraid to take Mary as his wife? He says, because that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. In the Greek, it was Jesus, which is the Greek name for Joshua. And it means God is salvation. And it tells us that, it confirms that. Because remember who he's writing to. He's writing to this Jewish audience who's thinking that the Messiah was supposed to come. They, they were, he was supposed to come and set up his earthly kingdom. But that's not what Jesus is coming for. Why is he coming? He says, he will save his people from their sins. He was coming to bring eternal salvation. He was not coming to overthrow Rome. He was coming to overthrow sin. Isn't that amazing? Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe there's never been a time where you truly recognized the, the ugliness of your sin and your desperate need for salvation. Well, God wants to work a miracle in you today. And it doesn't come from anything that, that we can do. That desire to be saved is conceived of the Holy Spirit. 
He draws us to himself. And by faith, we accept it. And we become free from our sins. Have you ever been freed from your sins? Are you still enslaved to sin? Why don't we fix that today? Why don't you take the bold step at the end of the service and come see me. And I'll be glad to share the gospel with you. How you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. That when your day comes, you will enter into the kingdom of God. What an amazing miracle. So the incarnation of the Messiah is proven by Matthew, first through the kingly heritage, second through the miraculous conception, but thirdly, through prophetic fulfillment. Through prophetic fulfillment. In verse 22 it says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. So he's looking back to an Old Testament text. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, if you heard what, what Fred read to us in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, you heard him read the virgin will conceive, and it's basically taken the same way in this English word. Well, the Hebrew word that would have originally been written in Isaiah was Alma which means young woman of marriageable age. When they rewrote the Old Testament in Greek, which is called the Septuagint, they used the Greek term Parthenos, which has to do with the, the speciality of the birth rather than something a little bit more, speci- uh, more general than what the original Hebrew would have been. Scholars teach that this is actually a double fulfillment text in Isaiah 7 verse 14 through 17. The person Isaiah is immediately speaking of in that context was his own son. Now, Fred did a good job reading the names. I'm not even going to try to read uh, Isaiah's name, uh, son's name. It's one of the longest names. Maybe I'll get Ron to do that for me later. But it was, it, the name is like this long, and it's got like four different breakdowns in it. If you keep reading through Isaiah, you eventually see it. But if you keep reading past into Isaiah 8, you realize that this promised son isn't just for immediate fulfillment. It's also for a future messianic fulfillment. And that's what Matthew is drawing on here. He's saying even though that text when it was originally written was for Isaiah's son, it had an ultimate fulfillment in the Messiah that would come. And it's said that his name would be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. Now, obviously, his legal name was not Emmanuel. It wasn't a designation of his title. It was a designation of his role. He was coming to save. He was coming to be with us. And interestingly, Matthew bookends this idea in the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, verse 20, he says to his apostles, I'm sure you'll remember it as soon as I say it, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Isn't that amazing that Matthew bookends his gospel with the promise that Christ will be with us? I will be with you. I am God with us and I will be with you even to the end of the age. Isn't that amazing promise that Matthew has given us? He bookends it for us. So that's a preview of coming attractions when we get to Matthew 28. Now it says, when Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she'd given birth to a son. He called his name Jesus. Interesting that, that people still refer to her as the Virgin Mary, as it says that he knew her not until she had given birth to a son. Scripture, of course, teaches throughout that there Jesus had... Uh, half-brothers, brothers through Mary and Joseph. We know one of them was James, the leader of the church in uh, Jerusalem. There's been some argument that, that, that really meant that they were cousins. I'm not really sure how that could happen. and I'm sure that there's someone who could try to make an admirable claim at that. But the bottom line is that Mary is not our salvation. Mary is not who we pray to. Christ is the one who made the way for us. Christ is the virgin born, son of God, conceived of the Holy Spirit. 
And that's why when I pray, when we talk about the gospel, I say he was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, took our sins on him, put him on the cross to death. And he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. That's the gospel. So what does that mean for us? What does this prophetic fulfillment mean for us? That means that when we are living in this hard life, even as believers, when we are walking in this hard life, when we are living in these COVID times, when we're experiencing death around us and suffering and we're experiencing loss and we're experiencing persecution and difficulty, we can trust the promises of God today. Just as his promises were fulfilled from the Old Testament through Christ in Matthew chapter 1, every word of God proves true. We can trust that he will fulfill his promises. God will not lie to us. We can trust him. We can trust him as our Messiah. When we're born again and we're followers of Christ, we can trust his promises. As Ron taught last week, that all things work together for good for those who love God. That's a promise to us that we can take to the bank. Because just as he fulfilled this promise, he will fulfill all the others. And that gives us hope. And that gives us joy. That means when you're going through temptations and you feel like you're not going to make it, you feel like you should just quit and just walk away from church. You should walk away from Christianity. You should walk away from Christ. doesn't matter what I do. I still get in trouble. I still do wrong. Listen, that's a promise that Jesus said there is no temptation that's overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But I will, with the temptation, make a way of escape so that you can bear it. That's a promise that we can trust today. This isn't just some Christmas do good, let's get a pageant up here. This is real life. And it'll change you. It'll transform you. If you hold on to the promises. It's not just a song we sing, standing on the promises. And then we go out and we don't trust any of them. We can trust the promises of God. Because Jesus fulfilled those promises as our Messiah. And we can take them to the bank. Do you believe that this morning? Do you trust in that this morning? Or has your faith gotten a little weak? Maybe the, the things that's going on around us and the, the lockdowns and the closures and the fear that's, that, that, that's just gripping everybody has just gotten a hold of you. and you've, you've lost your faith. You've lost your hope. You've lost your joy. Listen, the Messiah has come and he has promised to be with us. Emmanuel, God with us. And then he promised us in the Great Commission, I will be with you always. You are never alone if you've given your life to Christ. You are never alone. Online watching at home, because your health and, and other things that's keeping you at home, you are not alone if you know Christ. He is Emmanuel, God with us us he is with you hold on to that promise trust his promise and allow it to transform your life the incarnation of the messiah it's not about jingle bells it's not even about silent night it's about the incarnation of the messiah god with us Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, God, for your word and the hope that it gives us. And we thank you for the kingly heritage of Christ. God, that he took that kingly line that you set. And that it wasn't just for the Jews, but it was also for the seed of Abraham, which is us. As Paul taught in Romans 4, the same faith that saved Abraham is the faith that saves us today. We thank you for the miracle of the virgin birth and the faith that's required to believe that. And God, that's my prayer that if there's anyone here, Lord, that has never experienced the miraculous moving of the Holy Spirit in their lives, 
God, that you would draw them to you and that they would feel your presence. And God, that they would accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. God, for those of us who've been walking this Christian life, sometimes we get down, sometimes we lose our faith, sometimes we don't trust you like we should, we forget the promises of God. Lord, may we hold on to this promise that Jesus fulfilled in being the Messiah as hope that he will keep all his promises. All the promises that you've given us are yes. So God, help us to trust your promises. God, when we're feeling down and out, may we go to those promises in the scripture and pray them out. Even if we don't fully believe it at the time, may we cry out like the demoniacs, Father, I believe. Help my own belief. Help us to trust your word. God, as was taught last week, God, help us to trust that all things work together for those who love you and who are called according to your purpose. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand together. We're going to sing the chorus, verse, chorus, verse of Go Tell It on the Mountains. We want to talk about sharing the gospel. We're going to learn about the gospel of Jesus Christ through the gospel of Matthew. And then we need to go and tell it on the mountains that Jesus Christ is born. Let's stand together as we sing. on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born while shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks by night behold the throughout the heavens there shone a me challenge you this week. I want to give you one challenge. Tell someone that you work with or someone that doesn't already know in your family or friend or somebody. Tell them that you are a Christian and ask them if they know the true meaning of Christmas. Just do that much. And if they say no, don't feel like you got to have a theological answer, invite them to church. We're going to look at part two of the incarnation of the Messiah next week in Matthew 2. And we're going to share the gospel again. So take this opportunity to practice sharing the good news. Tell somebody that you have been, become a Christian and ask them, do they know the true meaning of Christmas? Can you do that? You can. I know you can. I trust you can. Well, with that challenge, may you be blessed this week. And trust and faith that God will be faithful to his promises to you. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.